Good morning. Hello. I hope you had a great coffee break and uh, enjoyed the opening. Um, we're going to get going because uh, there's lots to cover in all the sessions today. We want to keep you on time and we want to get you involved. So I'll start by saying uh, I'm Carol Ann Brown. I'm the president of the Delphi Group. I want to thank Kevin and Eco Canada for inviting us here today. We've had a long history of working with them, both in terms of uh, taking advantage of their great uh, programs to bring in new uh, interns and staff, as well as to do good, some great work with them as well on some of their studies. Um, we are here to talk to you about sustainability and innovation in clean tech, and how are they connected, as well as what are we talking about when we talk about those things, which is pretty key to the future of our workforce and our economy. Um, so, Delphi's been around for 35 years, uh, is a sustainability strategic management consulting company. That means that we were working on sustainability before it was cool, before anyone talked about ESG rolling off your tongue all day long. Um, <laughs> we are pro part of a larger group of organizations called Profoundry, which includes Globe Series, Canadian Business for Social Responsibility, and Leading Change Canada. Um, I'm going to... Uh, pass it over to my lovely colleagues and friends to introduce themselves as well, and then we're going to jump in. Christine. Morning, everyone. Uh, Christine O'Reilly. I work at Delphi with Carol Ann and Matt here, who will introduce himself next. I'm director of our innovation and clean tech service area, and basically what that means is that we work with our clients, which could be a, a wide range. It could be anyone from a municipality to a corporation to a not-for-profit, and we're helping them understand the clean solutions that can help them meet their sustainability goals within my team. So happy to be here and get into the chat. Matt, over to you. Hey, everyone. Hey, everyone. Okay, it is working now. Nice to see everyone here today. My name is Matt Beck. I'm Senior Director at Delphi, with, uh, working closely with Christine and Carol Ann every day, and working with uh, some of our many, many great clients. Um, my specialty is in carbon management and, and sustainability, and I've been working in the field for almost two decades now um, across lots of different sectors. I've uh, been with Delphi for about six years, but prior to that I worked a lot with oil and gas because, you know, you spend any time here in Calgary and you end up touching it because it's a pretty big file. Uh, so I do a lot of work in the energy sector and, uh, and, and particularly around helping organizations figure out what the kind of, you know, best choices for all of the various, you know, myriad of different ways to pursue sustainability and, and climate programs. and and uh, you know, further their objectives and maximize impact in any way that we can. Thank you, Christine and Matt. All right, I'm all about audience participation, so you can all groan collectively if you want, but we're gonna start off with a Slido poll. So um, if I can ask our good friends at the back uh, to bring up uh, the information where you could take a, yeah, that's right, if you're looking on your phones, you know what Slido is, there should be Thank you so much for our mugs. You can take our faces off. Um, there should be a, a, a QR code if you don't have Slido on your phone. And our question is, has your business or organization already set a net zero or other sustainability target? Simple, simple questions. Yes, no, we're planning to. Uh, and that will help us sort of situate our conversation here today. So thank you for all pulling up your phones. And this is all anonymous, so just want you to know, it doesn't matter what you put in, no one will know it's you, no one's going to be on the hook. Go ahead and, and, uh, and answer. And we'll see... Oh, it's taking oh, no. <laughs> our... On the Slido. Oh, so the QR code is wrong. All right. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to do a show of hands. Um, if anyone feels, yeah, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to get the, the different QR code um, put up. Interesting. All right. Um, if anyone feels comfortable saying, if you have, your organization has a target, love to see it, or don't have a target. If you have a target, put it up to your hand. Woo, okay, awesome. We've got folks in the room with targets. Planning on having a target. You're working on it. Okay. No target, doesn't exist, no one's talking about it. Great, 
All right. All right. Fantastic. Thanks so much for that. Okay. So, so we got some familiarity with the process. Uh, targets are not easy to set all the time. We've got to know how we get there. And that's what we want to focus on is um, how do you move from, you know, this is, this is how we get to a place where we're setting a sustainability target, but then what? How do we put that into action? And that's why my colleagues are here today. All right. So I'm going to pass it over um, to um, start sort of getting us on our journey here and ask Matt to tell us about what do, you, what do you mean you work in sustainability? What does that look like? All right. I mean, that, that's a huge question, right? I, I, I mean, many of us here work in the field. Um, I assume all of us in one way or another, if we're here at Eco Impact, we're, this, is, this is core to what we're thinking about day to day. So um, before I answer that, though, I'm, I'm a, little bit, I want a little bit more curious to the audience. Um, so I'm going to ask a slightly different raise your hands kind of question to get going here. How many people work for a, a large corporation uh, on, on topics related to sustainability? Great, great. Um, what about small and medium enterprises? OK. How about uh, consulting? OK, so that pretty much covers the room. Did I miss anything? How about? Nonprofits, yeah, I, I was about to go there as the, the next thing. So, um, you know, every organization is on a different place on their on their journey in sustainability, and this isn't, you know, yeah, we talk we talk a lot actually in our in our sister organization Globe Series, we talk a lot about um, getting to destination net zero or, or things like that, right? And we do talk about destinations, but but we all know that like. We're never really done with this work. There's always new things we learn, and there's you know ways to improve. Um, and it's just like any other aspect of running a good organization. We have to be constantly looking to make the organization and 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 our performance on these topics more effective. So, when we think about that in terms of the journey for sustainability, it's it's um, really there's a couple key things that. I like to think about when, when I think about how we uh, empower the folks that we work with, the companies we work for, to be, you know, to show up better as corporate citizens, to show up better and, and generate more impact. And, and one of those things is really understand why we're on this journey. You know, you really have to understand what your values are, what your motivations are, what are the drivers, and, and what's, what's leading you to think that this is something you need to pursue. And then, um, take take stock, right? Take stock about the you know various ways in which um, you're already doing great work uh, that's related to sustainability or ESG. You might t not talk about it in those terms because it's just something you've been doing for a long time. Maybe you know it could be something as simple and and seemingly not very impactful as the you know cafeteria food waste management or recycling or things like that. Anything can be a starting place. But just knowing where where we're at and what your culture is and competencies within the organization, and where the various you know pieces of this puzzle, you know ESG. I hate the term personally because we've been talking about sustainability in lots of different ways before ESG became a term. But I will give one thing credit: breaking it down into environmental issues, social issues, governance issues does provide a bit of a framework for us to think about, you know, the big list of different things that you can tie into. So, you know, credit where credit is due there. Um, but looking at those things, taking stock, and then from there, really identifying what, what are the places where you can generate the biggest impact. One of the things that we like to do is, you know, thinking about it in terms of a health check, right? Running through the list of topics that you can really... Um, uh, capture both in within your organization and, and within your organization's relationships to stakeholders, customers, investors, suppliers, etc. That are areas where perhaps there's large exposure to big issues, whether those be things like you know uh, forced labor or climate risk or things like that. Or huge opportunities for you to actually make impact, you know, within your organization or the world around you. So mapping that out, really kind of charting your journey, and understanding kind of where you're starting from and where you want to get to, 
is is really what we mean when we talk about going on the sustainability journey. And and unfortunately, many many of the companies that I've worked with over the years haven't done that work up front, and then it becomes very transactional, and the results that we see are often lesser for it, and and it could be so much more than what they become when it's just oh well we need to generate this report because it's you know disclosure rules or or oh we need to we need a target because our competitors have a target and we want to engage someone to do that if you don't really know why you're doing it and you don't have that place of where you're building from you're, you're losing so much chance of maximizing the value of this work awesome all right thanks so much matt um i'm gonna pass it to christine to set the scene when when you say clean tech what do, what do we mean yeah, so, I mean, clean tech is a pretty broad and all-encompassing term. It's a pretty loaded term. <laughs> um, we say clean tech. I mean, it's really a slang word, just clean technology. But what does that really mean for a technology to be clean? And basically, what we're saying is it's all of the things, the tools, the systems, the processes, the equipment, the hard tech, the software, all of the things that can help us reduce our environmental footprint of our operations or how we're currently doing things. And clean tech can apply anywhere. It can apply to your home, to your business, in an industrial facility. I think oftentimes when we think of clean tech, we do tend to automatically think of heavy industry or corporations, but clean tech can be applied across the board. Um, also, I think clean tech, when folks hear that word, they automatically have a picture in their mind of what that is. And it could be solar panels on a building or wind turbines in a field or an electric car. People have very specific things that they think about when they hear the word clean tech. And of course, those all are clean tech, but it goes well beyond that, um, you know, we often tend to put blinders on when it comes to clean tech and only focus on the climate or the emissions side of things. But as Matt was alluding to, you know, sustainability is so much more and clean solutions can help us in all areas, whether it's water or biodiversity, you know, air pollutants, waste, all of those things can be applied uh, to the lens of clean tech. And I think also the word clean tech has a lot of connotations on the tech side of things, the, the piece of hardware that's being installed or going in the ground. But it could be other things as well, right? There's a lot of innovative components to clean tech that might not necessarily be a piece of hardware. It could be a behavioral change um, from your customers or a behavioral change that you're bringing about from your employees, um, a new business model a new product that you generate from a waste stream that you weren't thinking about. All of those things are also clean tech. Uh, so it goes well beyond the tech side. Um, and kind of rounding it out and, and bringing it back to Matt's sustainability journey framing. When we say clean tech, I consider that to be the doing, the actionable part of sustainability strategy. So how we're actually going to meet our goals and the things we're going to do to start knocking off our footprint. And also, in addition to that sustainability or environmental case, there's also a lot of times, um, you know, an economic or a business case that comes along with clean tech. So if we're using less water, using less electricity, we're sending less waste to, to get a tipping fee, that in of itself makes our operations more efficient, ergo, you know, saving. So lots of times it's important to tie in that business case side of things as well into the clean tech story. Thank you. Clean Tech 101 with Christine. So for those of you in large organizations, you might be familiar with the fact that sometimes the people who are working on technology and development and research are over there, and people working on sustainability are over there. Um, large organizations, all large organizations have silos, even smaller ones do too. And sometimes there's that disconnect, right? And so um, because we care about the outcomes, we care about reducing our footprint, we care about having better social justice, we care about 
less uh, inequality. We have to break down those silos uh, in society, in our organizations, in our ecosystems, in our communities. And so what I want to turn to Christine and Matt about now is to talk to them about like in the work that you do and what you're seeing, how do we break down those silos? Like what are, what are they to begin with? Why do we have some barriers? And then how do we break them down? So Matt, like in your experience, what are the common barriers to getting an organization moving on sustainability then into their clean tech journey and, and, and how are those silos created? Uh, yeah, silos, the bane of so many of our existences when it comes to trying to do this work. Um, you know, firstly, I would say how silos show up, I think, looks a bit different in a large organization versus smaller organizations, right? Um, you know, in, in a large organization, I think there's a general level of bureaucracy that that kind of evolves by nature of the size of the organization that is probably the mo the greatest driver of you know silos within those organizations just because of the amount of red tape and 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 things like that there are other factors but but just that in and of itself regardless of whether we're talking about sustainability or clean tech silos or just general trying to align different parts of a large business in common objectives right um the best executives and ceos are the ones that have figured out ways to break through that effectively in the structure of their organizations in a lot of cases in smaller organizations it, it can be much more personal right it, you you can have a lot of ego attached to it it, it can be a, it's a much you know, softer set of, of factors that, that can contribute to uh, how these silos show up. And so, um, you know, keeping an eye out for the interests of your colleagues in a smaller organization uh, can, can be a really important way to gain insights into where there might be risks of silos developing and where you might have to in invest more work into dealing with that. Some, some of the you know, biggest pieces that I see in larger organizations beyond the general bureaucracy, though, that I, I think are important to consider is, um, you know, and especially these days, is, is there's, a, there's a really large uh, different in, difference in expectations and mindset between you know, the, the discipline and the practice of sustainability and how it's evolved and how it's uh, how similar practices for disclosure show up in finance and 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 these days with more and more regulations pushing the the thinking around how we disclose information related to this uh, to align regardless of whether it's financial or extra financial that that barrier that tension can be really really strong thanks Matt Christine what about from that to moving into clean tech? Yeah, in terms of silo creation, um, I think it's pretty common that that silo can get created right at the start, like right when you're deciding to go on that sustainability journey. Maybe you've decided to set a target or a goal and you've decided to create a strategy. Oftentimes, that strategy is kind of framed around a long-term vision. And we don't necessarily set that strategy up uh, with a short-term mindset in terms of things we can do today. And I think that creates a silo because then you have people saying, well, that's something we're going to work on in 10 years. It's not something we're working on right now. That's somebody else's problem. And then building off that, I would say in general, around sustainability, um, we create a silo just naturally as humans, because we love to put everything in a nice little box or a nice little bag and, and send it off and say that's where that goes. Sustainability is here, regulatory is here, you know, governance is here, innovation and clean tech is doing their thing over here. But we really do ourselves a disservice by viewing sustainability in that lens because 
then you're creating sustainability as this separate team or this separate function that's working on sustainability on behalf of your organization. But really, sustainability is so multifaceted and it's so embedded in all areas of your business that you need to bring everybody on board. You need to make everybody a part of that journey and make it feel like it's also their responsibility. Sustainability is on everybody's team. Sustainability is on everybody's committee. Without that framing, again, we create a silo because sustainability is something that's being worked on by somebody else, and it's somebody else's problem. So that sounds like, you know, if we're actually bringing everyone on board in an organization uh, to have an understanding and a piece of a sustainability journey, it's part of the solution to dealing with the inherent silos that we create or barriers that we create and how we organize ourselves and how we view our work. Are there other ways in which we, we can break down those barriers? Are there other solutions to the sort of the default way of doing sustainability and clean tech work? To me? Mm, to both of you, yeah, <laughs> go for it. Uh, I will go first. Um, yeah, in terms of breaking down those silos or those barriers, I'll build off the narrative that I was going along with around designing your strategy to be also having those short-term uh, impacts in mind and not just long-term. So when we're creating sustainability goals and targets, you know, for the most part, we're looking at net zero by 2050 or carbon neutral by 2040 or whatever that might be. And that is so far in the future that that kind of framing, again, it, it makes people feel like it's not something that's actively being worked on today. And that's why it's really important to build in those low-hanging fruit or opportunities that you can start to action today, right from the start. Not only from a bringing the team along and making them feel like this is something that's actively being worked on and you're collecting data and showing impact right away, but also you're starting to build out the skill set within your team that's going to be needed down the line for much bigger changes. So a lot of the changes that we're going to see are going to be very disruptive to companies right? And they're not really prepared for what that means internally. So starting small and targeting low hanging fruit or things you can start to action today is, is really important. And I'll go back to Matt's note about the health check or kind of the gut check in terms of identifying what you want those opportunities to be. Just start by doing a level set with yourself and, and look at your footprint and your operations to say, well, what are we doing pretty well at? We won't want to target that today. We'll deal with that down the line. What are we doing okay at? Again, we'll want to fix that, but maybe not today. Where's our, our worst offenders? Where are we doing the worst at? And maybe target there because it's where you're going to immediately start to see impact. And that impact is really important for building that narrative and the rapport and, like I said, the skill set within the team. Matt, do you have things to add to that? Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I sometimes, you know, in working on our and our leadership team at Delphi, I get to work with a lot of our junior staff, right? Um, analysts that are joining fresh out of university, maybe with a couple of years of experience, excited, passionate, want to make impact, but you know, we we need to help them learn the skills of the trade and the knowledge and, and help them kind of focus in on their knowledge areas and expertise and develop that. And, you know, consulting is, is um, you know, it's a little bit different than working inside corporate and I've worked in corporate too, but, but one, of the, one of the things I've, I've talked about a lot with our junior staff over, over the years is, is actually, um, it's like a topic I like to call, most of the stuff I really needed to learn about consulting, I learned as a ski bum. And, uh, and and I know skiing is a pretty elitist sport, but just humor me here for a second. Um, one of the things when you're living, you know, as a dirtbag ski bum, kind of paycheck to paycheck, uh, you know, out of the back of your van or whatever at the ski hill is um, you have to learn how to relate to uh, your your peers who are, you know, scrounging for leftover food at the base lodge just like you as well as you know um you know 
people that are coming in from you know New York, Houston, wherever, taking their families on these really ritzy vacations, and and convince them that they want to you know if you're a ski instructor or something they want to hire you to teach their kids to ski and they can trust you and 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 what you learn really quick in order to survive in that world is is you have to figure out how to relate to people and every organization is nothing without the people within it and so the most important fundamental tool that we have to break down silos is to build relationships and and that starts one on one people to people uh, it also has to start from the top if that's not reinforced from the executive of an organization whether it's a small business or a large enterprise the amount of work that needs to be done at lower levels of the organization is going to be tremendous. So um, while you're building those relationships, making sure that you're getting that alignment at the senior level so that that message is being reinforced is going to be your greatest opportunity to break down silos. Thanks, Matt. I guess you guys weren't expecting a ski bum analogy and story. We, good. <laughs> we aim to entertain. I don't think she was either. Yeah, no, I wasn't. But that's Matt. That's I know him to be like that. Okay, so so as Christine said, this is what's like what we like about clean tech is the actionable part. It's like how do we get on with solutions? And we we have another slide I'll pull, which now I'm nervous to ask to bring up, given that we went to a translation. Um, but it was really more about uh, it was a question for you guys to either put in Slido or maybe we can do a show of hands. Um, just to go like, have you gone down this road at all? Are you familiar with what's out there? How do we actually get to action and doing things that have an impact? So I see them busy and so I'm gonna ask for a show of hands instead of using the technology because we're a small enough room that we can be friends here and put our hands up. She's gonna try. Okay, if you wanna try, we can try. <laughs> it's all right. No? Okay. All right. Great. Then, okay. So, so the question we had was, has your organization ever leveraged support? So government funding, tax incentives, rebates, webinars, toolkits, blah, 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 to help you along your sustainability journey from planning to implementation. So I'm going to start with one. And this could be broad because, you know, like Eagle Canada has all that um, co-op uh, funding that's available, so I'll include that in this questions. So and we've certainly enjoyed a lot of that funding over the years. We continue to enjoy a lot of it. Yeah, yes, it's we love great it. for bringing interns in. And, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. So who here has uh, leveraged government funding for? Yeah, government funding. Yes, there's a reason why we pay taxes. Good. Uh, who here? Um, has had the chance to take advantage of tax incentives or rebates in their sustainability implementation journey. This is personally, I've done energy efficiency retrofits uh, in my house. Rebates are great. Okay, there's lots out there. Um, who's actually gone on like a capacity building journey, gone on webinars? Like where is the learning coming from? Yes, great. Um, lots of toolkits and calculators out there. Have you come across those, leveraged those at all? All right, wonderful. Um, and anyone got other things that they say was super useful, they want to put up their hand and share, this is what I leveraged on my journey and it was fantastic. Anybody want to share? The experiences of other companies or people or yeah. entities and what went wrong and what didn't. Yeah, great. What went well. What, but well, yes, yes, and that's why we're here, right? We're all here to sort of learn from each other, talk to each other, pick each other's brains. What did you do? How did you get past this? Where would be some suggestions? That's a very important one, using our ecosystems to help us on our journey. All right, so on that vein of implementation, thank you everyone for participating. Um, on that vein of implementation, all right, Matt and Christine, what, Matt, are the key considerations for designing a sustainability strategy that's focused on successful implementation? How does that get integrated? So, um, Christine and and Caroline, you both mentioned earlier, uh, you know, a little bit of the the aspects of how how clean tech is a lot more than what you know the traditional lines of it is. Well, one of the things that I think a lot about. Uh, especially lately, is that 
when we think about designing strategy for implementation and, and designing um, the business process around that in an effective way, we can actually think of business process as clean tech, right? And, and a well thought through business process that, that enables execution on strategy and implementing uh, towards these goals um, and enables the collaboration across, like we talked about with the silos, breaking down those walls, um, is like if you keep that in mind as you're designing this strategy of like how can this be a technology for making the organization cleaner or, or more sustainable, um, you'll find so many hooks just there. Um, and kind of related to that is, is something that I think we all have to um, think of carefully as sustainability professionals. I know I'm guilty of this and I've caught myself in this many, many times is that as a profession, I think we, we have a tendency to want to do things, quote unquote, the right way for sustainability uh, without considering that, you know, many of, of, of the processes and things we need to do to implement on strategy are problems that are the, the, the same problem, different flavor from many other types of, of business challenges in, in order to achieve success. So thinking about what an organization is already doing, what business processes are already in existence that are that maybe just need a little tweak to consider factors related to sustainability and and out the outcomes that we're trying to achieve here rather than trying to reinvent the wheel and create a whole new process. Great. Christine? Yeah, in terms of setting your strategy up for successful implementation, um, I, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, but it's all about giving yourself enough time and enough Grace to, to change out those those systems that you're talking about, Matt. And maybe it is just a tweak, but those systems will need to change. Um, a lot of businesses aren't already or currently set up for some of the the changes and the solutions that are coming. If you you know set your strategy up so that one day you plan to flick the switch and you're going to do that change automatically, you again you, you've done yourself a disservice and you've not given yourself enough buffer to work on um, what some of those changes are going to need to be. And again, I think starting with those low-hanging fruit or easy-to-implement opportunities are going to give you a lot of lessons learned that you can take and adapt so that when you go to do that full-scale change, you're ready. And that could be something as, you know, as simple as looking at your procurement process and saying, okay, our current procurement process isn't actually set up for the new solutions that are on the market. So we have to change our procurement in order to be able to bring those new solutions even in the door in the first place. Maybe we will no longer have the right skill sets or expertise in-house, so we're going to have to look at hiring new staff. Maybe the way we currently hire staff isn't appropriate for the new resourcing we need to bring in. So we need to change how we're hiring. You know, maybe there's other governance and policies that need to change as well. But setting yourself up for successful implementation is making sure that your strategy accounts for those changes that need to happen internally. Because if you don't set yourself up in that way, when the time comes to implement, you're then going to be setting yourself back because you're not ready to do it. Yeah. And so... The tech is sexy, right? Like we all like new shiny things that go, wow, we haven't seen that before. But it's actually all the stuff around the tech that's just as important, sometimes more important. Now, one of the things, however, that, and thank you, Christine, for that. Um, one of the things, however, that's usually quite key and is a, is a big question is the money, right? Where, where is the financial support to help reduce the cost of new technology, new processes, new things you're bringing in to get to that positive outcome. And so where do we get those? Like, apart from our good friends at Eco Canada who helps us with uh, interns, where, where, where's the bigger pots of money for big solutions? 
Yeah, so I think it really depends on, you know, what industry you're in, what type of organization you are, whether you're a small, medium enterprise or a startup or a large corporate. Um, that will all be linked into what pots of money are available to you. Um, you know, federally, lots of the departments, the Natural Resource Canada, um, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada, I said, so your innovation, science, and economic development, they all generally are putting out funding calls to help uh, accelerate technology development uh, and also deployment. So it could be earlier stage when you're in that research development or also later stage when you're ready to test or trial it in the real world. Uh, provincially, yeah, a lot of the provincial and, and territorial associations have that funding as well. Um, the important thing about those funding pockets of money, they do tend to be larger uh, for larger technology development projects. For those, it's all about the narrative. So the government is really interested in understanding how that tech is going to be developed, what does that mean for the broader ecosystem, not only what are the environmental benefits, but what are the social impacts what are the economic impacts? Having that story lined up is really important for accessing those bigger pots of money. Um, and then there's you know, smaller things like rebate programs, incentive programs that would again be offered by either federal or provincial and territorial governments. Um, so that would be things like you know, building envelope projects, so changing out your, your lights or your insulation and windows. Maybe you're swapping out uh, equipment for more energy efficient versions. There's lots of rebate programs out there available for that and those tend to be pretty continuous or, or standard humming along in, in the background. You know, things become popular and we see new rebates pop up. Uh, you know, in the last 18 months we've seen a lot of federal EV charger rebates for businesses. So the thing about the rebate programs is that there's basically just a cap. People apply and once the cap is reached, that's it. So if rebate programs are something of interest, it's really important to keep an eye on what's happening in that space and apply sooner rather than later. Because once the cap is reached, they could expect it to happen in two years, but it actually happens in six months. And then you may be waiting three, four years for the next rebate pot to come around. Um, yeah, so in general, there are pockets of money out there, I would say, sign up for newsletters for all of these agencies and departments, um, and don't be afraid to reach out to them. Ask them what they have available. They have advisors, and um, they're always willing to help people out. I would say, yeah, don't be afraid to ask questions when it's related to funding and what's available for your specific organization. And as you can tell, Christine's a walking compendium of them, so you can also come find her afterwards. Um, similarly, Matt, thank you, Christine. So what, what's out there to help organizations, you know, who need help with sustainability strategies, like tools or thought leadership or, yeah, advice? Yeah, well, um, we are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I'm just kidding. Um, not kidding. No, yeah. uh, but, uh, but beyond that, the, like, it's so confusing now. There's so much advice out there, and it's often conflicting, right? And, um, and, and so, you know, depending on what you're looking for, you might go to, you know, some of the toolkits that international organizations are producing. You know, you know I think about, you know, if, if, we, if we go and zero in on the climate file, we think about, you know, climate disclosure. Um, some of the greatest, um, at, like, you know, force in the recent years towards the evolution of how people are thinking about climate, developing climate issue management programs for their organizations has come from some publications out of uh, the task force on climate related financial disclosures and their recommendations, right? It wasn't just about here's how you disclose it. I mean, that's obviously a huge focus of it, but a lot of the lessons that they compiled in those, in those documents and those guides and, and resources that they've uh, made available are actually about how to set up good management systems, right? And um, and so that's a huge uh, source. You know, pick your topic. There's usually a, a you know great organization that's trying to do their best to publish. Industry associations often have great toolkits um, that are sector focused. Uh, and then you know, just like with funding, 
you know, we often see governments, um, you know, provide support. One of the really cool things uh, that I've seen um, in my role sitting on, uh, you know, outside of Delphi, I'm also a board member with the Battery Metals Association of Canada. And, and one of the, the, the great things that we've been doing with Battery Metals Association, BMAC, um, has been a partnership with IRAP. And, um, you know, most people think IRAP, oh, that's a funding source. But actually, when you partner with IRAP as, as a company, it, yes, there's often funds attached to, to your partnership, but there's also lots of capacity building. So through BMAC, we're actually um, supporting uh, expertise transfer to IRAP clients in you know critical minerals and, and battery technologies and 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 some innovative approaches in that space and it's exposing a lot of different IRAP clients to um, that whole sector. So IRAP is the Canadian Research Council's uh, Industrial Research Assistance Program. I didn't even know what the acronym yeah. meant because <laughs> that's their wheelhouse. <laughs> Yeah, so there is, there's a huge amount of things out there. Those are great examples, Matt. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. So we are about 10 minutes away from wrapping um, because these things always go quickly. And we wanted to uh, give you the opportunity to ask any questions. Um, and so our um, colleague is going to be getting a handheld mic to if anyone put, wants to put up their hand. Um, and I'll give you a minute to warm up and think about what do you what would you want to ask Matt and Christine sustainability clean tech implementation it's a big topic anything specific you have top of mind because if wonderful thank you do you want to just share your name and who you're with when you ask the question I appreciate that uh, sorry I'm not gonna stand up I got cracked ribs but uh, I'm with Workforce Strategies International we're a consulting firm yeah. but we're competency nerds that's what we love but my question is I really liked your definition of clean tech. I am guilty of the tech and the software side of thinking about it, the stuff. Um, how are you guys finding industry? Is it thinking in this way? Is it adopting this way? Is it a struggle for you guys? Like, how does that work? Yeah, I can start and maybe Caroline can chime in. I will lean on her if we get any tough questions. Uh, lean into the manager um, yeah I they're getting there I would say they're still thinking very much about the tech and that when you bring them or help them be aware of some of those other aspects like the innovation side of things um, and some of those implementation considerations that I spoke to you know procurement and all of the things that are underneath technology there you can see that the light bulb goes off and they are going there but generally speaking I would say we're just starting to get there with a number of our clients and moving from strategy to implementation and taking them down that road um, yeah so getting there uh, and on their way but still maybe stuck in the tech space and not um, framing it from all the other things that need to come in to support tech implementation yeah and it's it's it depends on the sector, right, and, the, and an organization and, and where they're coming from and what their culture is. Um, connecting the dots is hard, right, because it's not just what's, the, what's the, sustainability, the overall sustainability strategy, what are the targets, what are the things that have to be put in place, the disclosure, the systems, the data, the solution set. It's the workforce, which is the overarching theme of today and tomorrow. And, and thinking in that piece on the workforce is pretty problematic because it's not just that one organization or one, that, that one sector, it's the whole economy, right? Um, and and so, so there are good signs. Uh, we got a lot of work to do, I think. Yeah, great question, thank you. Any, any other questions? Come on, you can put them on the hot seat. They're, they're resilient. Yes, at the back. Hi, my name is Pooja. I work at Eco Canada. Uh, so my question is, um, small and medium enterprises, uh, they usually don't have the number of people that you need to do a lot of research, to look at a lot of fundings that are out there. So is there any specific places or any specific websites that they can go to to look at all the financial assistance or financial rewards that are out there? Because sometimes they don't have the time. Yeah, it's a great... It's a great question, um, and I will start with bigger context, and maybe you have some specific examples. 
Um, so uh, two sides. One, um, to Matt's point earlier, you know, sometimes associations or types of collectives are good places for that information. I know that the government of Alberta has created a compendium of all the funding sources for clean innovation and technology. And so there are government websites that try to provide this one-stop shopping. At a federal level, there is a, um, the Clean Growth Hub, which is meant to be the, the one-stop shopping window concierge service for all sizes of companies. Um, and they are actually, all, all federal departments are represented within this hub. And so they have advisors within the hub that understand everything going on within the department and how they connect to all the other initiatives within the federal system. Um, on the flip side, um, our collective of organizations, you know, the one that's a membership organization for businesses has an SME program. And so another way to get at, where do I go, what do I do, is to your point earlier, how do you, who, do you, who can you talk to about um, where do I get this funding? How do I even access it? What do I have to set up to get there? You know, what are my opportunities? Sometimes it's talking to other people as much as going to find the websites as well. Christine, sorry, I covered the field on that one. <laughs> yes, you did. I don't have too much to add, but um, so I would say for small and medium businesses, one other place to look that would maybe be focusing on them for funding and not large corporates would be maybe some of your grassroots community organizations. So for an example, here in Alberta, we have Alberta Ecotrust. And Alberta Ecotrust has their Climate Innovation Fund, which is really focused on uh, climate initiatives within Alberta's two large urban centers, Edmonton and Calgary, particularly focused on smaller scale projects that small medium businesses would be looking to fund. So they aren't large pots of money, but they're really focusing on, okay, we, we think the corporates are covered. They've got large pots of money coming from the federal provincial governments for them and uh, really looking to create a bit of a niche. So I would recommend checking out some of those community or grassroots organizations because uh, that seems to be where they're trying to, to target their funding. Yeah, it's a great point. The other, the other um, place to go would be Prairies Canada. So Prairies Can, the, uh, the federal regional economic development agency that is very focused on SMEs and local ecosystems. So that would be another source of what would be available, what kind of supports, for sure. Another, another piece of this, if, if, we, if we're thinking... Um, Kind of taking a step back and thinking about you know where if I'm running an SME or, or or part of a team running an SME and I have limited resources and time, what do I want to do that's going to be most impactful? Is it researching where these things are? Maybe it could be if depending on sector and what your solution is and what you're bringing to market. Um, but one of the things that I've seen work time and again when you have limited time is instead of trying to uh, seek out and, and pull, like pull this information out piecemeal, looking at all these different places or connecting, is uh, figure out a way to get people to want to come to you, right? And, and this is going back to, to Christine's story, the comments around, you know, the narrative is so important here. Before I joined Delphi, I had the pleasure of working for a small oil and gas startup called Imaginea Energy, run by a dynamo of a CEO, Suzanne West. Unfortunately, she's passed, and, and we all uh, miss her dearly. Um, but what she was so good at was creating such a compelling narrative that everybody wanted to just reach out to her and see if there was something they could spend their money on with her or, or um, attracting you know, technology opportunities, like, hey, maybe our technology could work. And she would just open up the sandbox and, and ask people to come play. And so if you craft the right narrative, you might surprise yourself with limited amount of time and resources that all of a sudden people are just knocking on your door rather than you having to chase them down. The dream. Thanks, Thanks Matt. It's not as elusive as you think. No, it's not. That's not. Any other questions? Wonderful. Yeah. 
It's not a question, but I wanted to make a small plug. Um, I'm actually with Albert Eco Trust Foundation. Well, thanks for the shout out, Christine. But um, Eco Canada has a program that we supported that is uh, supporting SMEs in looking at their operations, how to make a GHG management plan, because you have to know you know, where you're starting to realize what the opportunities are. So I want to make a plug for that. Um, locally in Calgary, we're also partnering with Green Economy Canada to give a similar sort of program looking for small um, businesses, small medium businesses, nonprofits to, to help them with that support. So it's a hub where you can learn and share with others. Um, in Edmonton, there's also the Corporate Climate Leaders Club, also run by Green Economy Canada. So I just want to give a shout out to those for if you're just not sure where to start, those are really great resources. Thanks for adding that. Uh, there is tons around. It's just, yeah, yeah, we need to list them somewhere that everyone can find at all times. Please, go ahead. Hi, thanks, Stephanie. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working as a en chemical engineer in uh, carbon lock technologies. I'm from Winnipeg, Manitoba. So I have a question, like we are a startup and we do, we are like proceeding towards like achieving some clean tech technologies. So my question is, uh, being a startup, we are like not a big team. We have like uh, responsibilities that are uh, like just shared. So I just need to understand we do have like sustainable goals to achieve. It's just that we are not able to being a small like organization. We are not able to uh, dedicate some time to re like organize the data or maintain a report so that in future uh, we can present it if needed. So how can we you know like as, an, as a small organization, we can s take an initiative to like record those. Yeah, yeah, totally fair question. And um, I think Christine and Matt both have perspectives on that. And yeah. my only like overarching comment is that it's, it's steps, it's steps along the way. So what can you start with to eventually get to where you may want to be? Matt, Christine. So yeah, well, one thing, um, are you looking to, like, as a startup, like your product, are you looking to export this product out of Canada, perchance? Maybe in future. We are not sure. Not there yet? Now, but, yeah, okay. right now our target is just, like, All domestic. Right. The reason why I ask that is, is, is um, uh, we've actually worked with some clients who have exactly that. And this is, a, this is a common thing, especially with clean tech companies. We saw it with solar power companies, things like this, too, earlier on. Um, when your product is sustainable, it's, hard, it's really easy to just focus all your energy in getting this product that unlocks sustainability to the market and not spending as much focused on like the things that maybe a less sustainable organization, like you know, an oil and gas company that's in the crosshairs for, for a lot of these issues, uh, would need to on disclosure and talking about all the ways that they're managing the risk of the fact that they're bringing this non-sustainable product. And, um, and so we see this all the time. But if you're exporting that product, actually um, Export Development Canada has had some programs that they'll, they'll actually support you on that journey and help you up your game and bring resources to you to help with some of those things that are key hurdles to unlock to be able to access export markets. Um, so that's that's one thing. But as Carol Ann said, the, the biggest thing is is just figuring out how to embed it from a principles uh, approach first. Start with your principles, start with your values, and then just make sure that when you're building parts of that business as you're working the startup, that you're not forgetting to ask these questions of how do we do this in a way, as we're building it from day one, that is sustainable. Because as soon as you build something, we all have that like, oh, we already did that. We don't want to touch it again. We don't want to go back there. Um, I mean, we're plagued with it in our in our organization. We we implemented some enterprise IT systems, didn't quite get it right the first time around, and now it's like, don't even talk about replacing that. We're not going there. We we still feel the pain of the last time we tried to work on that project. We're going to work on some other things right now, right? So if you miss that window when you're first starting. And, and you're actually like building the system that's going to help your business scale, it could be a long time before you go back. So just make sure you're asking those simple questions. Is there something easy I could do that allows me to grow in that way? Yeah, I don't know that I have a lot of uh, advice, only that it is very challenging to do that as a, a startup or a small business. Um, I would say be very 
open and honest with where you are on that journey. Um, you know, if you had a plan, make a plan for the year, and if you only got 50% of the way through, tell folks that, right? We're in that journey ourselves. We're creating a net zero strategy for ourselves as a business. Um, and it is, it is challenging, even if we are in this space, to balance the priorities of running the business and then um, setting your own sustainability goals. It is definitely a challenge. And I, I was the volunteer green team lead for the last year. So you have my full empathy on, on how challenging it is. No, I, I'm serious. <laughs> We were, but, yeah. Christine was constantly asking for input from the company. Everyone's like, yeah, yeah, we'll get, we'll get you that. And then, you know, inevitably it's like, oh, I got this project and that project. Christine's like, hey, are you going to ever give me that feedback? Yeah. So my advice is, yeah, just to be open and honest about how that journey is, is going for you. Um, and even in telling that story, you'll probably identify peers and partners that are going through the same struggles as you and maybe come up with some creative ways, even just by putting the story out there that we're working on it. But it's really hard. Awesome. Thanks a lot. I think we need a, like a group or networking teams to discuss in future how we are you know, navigating through those challenges. Thanks. Yeah. That line sometimes blurs between group networking and group therapy. <laughs> Generally in sustainability, yes. Um, did we have one more question? Okay. All right. Go for it. Yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Farooq. Uh, that was a wonderful discussion. So I actually have two questions. Uh, so my background is I am a mechanical engineer and environmental engineer. I worked on the environmental implementation site for 18 years in different countries. And in 2017, I moved to Canada. And now I am working as a consultant in sustainability and environment with the green sky. So I was listening to the local radio channel last week. So they were saying that uh, in next five to 10 years, the AI and digital technology is going to eliminate 45,000 jobs in the Canada. So I want to know about your view on this because I, I actually visited the remote areas in Canada for verification, GIG verification. So I listened to the people and they actually, they were saying that previously there were five operators in that field and that was extremely remote like 100 kilometers on the west of the south, uh, on the white court. So they said, now they have removed three operators and we are only two. And that was extremely remote. It took me one hour to reach to that point from the city. So first question is that, how will you address it and what is your view on that? Yeah. Well, the second point is that, like the technology is actually going to be very energy intensive. Yes. Yeah, for example, in this room, we are using this sound system, mobile, this projector, light, camera, everything is energy intensive. So how do you think like this energy intensive technology can be the sustainable future? So what is your view on that? Thank you very much. Yeah. So conscious that the sessions are wrapping up. So Matt, I will give you a minute. Um, and we can continue offline to provide a response. Yes, please direct that to Matt. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, um, wow. To, to answer either of those questions in a minute is, uh, I, I, yeah, it's impossible. But what, here, here, here's one thing I will say. Um, I, there's so many forecasts out there around the impact of AI, and we've, we've heard this you know, time and again with new technologies as they come in. And... and you know, the one thing that I can say, you know, if we look back at, you know, any kind of technology adoption that's disruptive, jobs aren't eliminated, they're shifted, right? And, and this is a workforce conference, you know, where you're, uh, you know, what does workforce look like and, and through transition and things like that? These are the kinds of questions we need to ask. It, it's, it's not how are we going to deal with the elimination of jobs, it's how are we going to ensure that people are equipped to utilize these new disruptive technologies in the ways that we want to generate the outcomes. So that's question one. Question two, just, just to wrap, uh, in, 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 ter in terms of, um, you know, in terms of how we deal with energy intensity, um, I, I, uh, I have mixed feelings about this. 
yes, these technologies have large energy intensities, um, but also they're some of the easiest to manage the uh, footprint of that energy intensity. Um, data centers are actually you know, pretty easy to connect to cleaner energy sources in, in many cases. And a lot of the cloud service providers are actually leading the way in driving you know, new renewable generation to power their infrastructure. And when used properly, these technologies can massively improve legacy energy intensive uh, hardware that can reduce a lot. So I think we just have to be very mindful of the energy ROI in deploying these resources. Yes, they take energy, but if used well, we can deploy them to get a lot more ROI by the way we use them. All right. Thank you very much, all of you, um, for coming, for being part of this conversation with us, for asking great questions. Um, it's a journey, right? It can be messy, two steps forward, three steps sideways, um, but we can get there collectively. All right, thank you so much, and we'll see you around. There's a break. Thank you.